So it's uh, my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker who was very gracious to be able to join us this evening to talk about a subject that I think is very appropriate for June, considering we were just talking about field day where people do what? They go outdoors and practice radio in uh, without a roof over their head, or at least a permanent roof. Um, so Mindy Hull, KM1NDY, a very easy call to remember, uh, is over there and is going to, uh, I'll, I'll introduce her briefly, and then the talk is Where Radio Meets the Outdoors Portable Operations. So Mindy was licensed in February 2019 and has an extra class license. And Mindy uh, has a lot of activity and I'm getting tired even just reading this particular biography. She's activated 34 peaks for summits on the air. She's tied for 30th in the New England Association or W1 and she's an active parks in the air participant. And she lives in South Boston. And um, the longest hike she has taken was 12 days and 140 miles on the Northville Lake Placid, uh, Placid Trail, which traverses the Adirondacks with her husband and a dog. And so Mindy, the floor is yours. Again, we very much appreciate you coming to talk to us and we're looking forward to the talk. Hey, thanks guys, I appreciate it. And uh, thanks Phil for inviting me and I'm really delighted to be here. Can, first off, can you hear me okay? Okay, good. And, uh, how long uh, do I have? I guess that's the other. Um, it's really up to you. Uh, we'll, we'll leave it to your discretion. Okay. Well, you'll, we'll you'll get tired before we do. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, but I actually love the topic of portable radio, so I probably could talk ad nauseum at it, but we'll try not to do that. Um, and then Phil did give me the heads up that most people in this club, and I can tell by your calls, and I think I've even had some contacts with some of you. In some of our adventures. So uh, I can tell by most people are pretty experienced radio operators is what Phil told me. Uh, and I was curious though, how many are uh, outdoor people in general? How many people are? Okay. Quite a few. Okay. All right, good. Because that's where I, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to compete with anyone's radio knowledge, let's put it that way. But uh, I hope to have a good outdoor uh, discussion as well in this. So I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if I can get it to work here. Um. Also, folks, if everyone else could mute, uh, just that we've got a little bit of background noise in there, and that will help us hear the speaker clearly. Thank you. All right, are we seeing the full screen? Yes, indeed. Any, uh, and you can see my cursor? Uh, yes. Okay, good. All right. Uh, let's see. A little message came up with people like way. Okay, so uh, again, I'm KM1NDY. I just prefer kind of team ND to be honest. Uh, and I'll just be talking about practical portable radio operation. Uh, I hear this, uh, the, the beginning I'll go through pretty quickly because I, when I initially made this talk, it was really to kind of draw in some of the people who aren't uh, very experienced operators. But I still think it's useful to just take an assessment of where everybody is with radio, and you'll see what I mean as we go through this. Uh, so portable radio to me is just, you simply bring your radio with you. Um, it's a radio operation that is not confined to a fixed station or, sh or shack. And from my perspective, I, I, can't, I can't always tell if it's the purple car phenomenon, if you go out and buy a purple car, then you see them everywhere, uh, or if it's true, but it seems to me that portable radio is all the rage in, in, uh, in the ham world. So uh, the purpose of this talk is really simple. I just want to inspire people to get out and operate because I, I want to talk to you out there too. So the more the merrier. Uh, and the question that stands is portable amateur radio for you. The answer is a resounding yes. And field day coming up means it's for everybody with the Super Bowl of ham radio coming. Uh, start off with just an assessment of where, where you are with your relationship with the ham radio hobby. I think it's useful just to think of what kind of operator that you are and what kind of operator do you wish to be. Are you a local FM repeaters type operator, distance HF, DX type operator? Do you operate QRO, QRP? Uh, do you like organized activities such as contesting, field days, soda poda, or the WWFF? Are you a maker, home brewer? Do you have esoteric specialized interests, you moon bounce, things like that, amateur radio direction finding? What do you enjoy and what do you want to enjoy? Do you like the club setting where you can uh, prefer to let others operate and just like the social aspects of radio or the intellectual aspects? Are you part of the MCOM 
community. You have no idea whatsoever uh, because you're a new ham and uh, whatever that last thing. So yeah, an accommodation of all of them. I have a little screen that's sitting at the bottom of mine that's covering things up. I don't think you guys can see that. Where do you prefer to operate or where do you operate? Is it out of your home, out of a vehicle? Uh, do you operate portable, taking your radio with, with you? Do you use someone else's station, like a club station? Or are you just starting to get into radio? And then take an assessment of your equipment. What do you already have, a handheld? Uh, do you have a permanent base station that you don't want to move? Do you have a temporarily mounted base station that's movable? Do you have a fixed mobile radio in your vehicle or a temporarily mounted mobile radio in your vehicle? So just get an assessment of what gear that you have as you're going through this too. Uh, do you use someone else's radio or do you have none at all and you're just uh, getting ready? And this is a, this is a part uh, I wanted to put in just for the technician class. I, I wasn't sure by the calls that there are any technicians in the audience, but I think regardless, uh, I think you can take a look and just see that for me, radio is really inspirational. It's, it's almost an art form. Uh, and with that, with especially with the VHF contest, Previously, you don't want to discount what you can do with your technician license. There's still a lot of things you can do. Uh, satellite work, you can see that's my husband. He'll show up here AA1F. Uh, this is a new call. It used to be WX1MAR. Uh, but he's kind of tagged along with radio with me. I got my license first, and then he uh, he decided he didn't want to lose me to ham radio, so he decided to join, join me on the, the journey. Uh, you can use your HT for really a gateway to some really unusual places. This, if you guys have never been here, is the Quincy Quarries. Up here, this is known as the K Wall. Uh, and I'm standing on top of the K Wall here. It's about 55 feet. That's one of the favorite rock climbing walls uh, in the Boston area. Amateur radio direction finding. Uh, is something right now, the Bristol County, uh, Bristol County Repeater Association has been sponsoring uh, ARDF, and we've been trying to join them. Uh, I'm part of the SciTech Amateur Radio Society. Uh, I consider my home club, but um, we try to get around to the other radio clubs too to enjoy the activities that they, they sponsor. Summits on the air, if you, this right here, this is Tully Mountain uh, in Royalston. This is Kobe Mountain. Uh, this here is Mount Wachusett. Another thing that I like to do is to uh, gather up club members and other people and sponsor kind of group uh, outdoor activities. So this is one of ours on Mount Wachusett. And you can see again, all this, this really isn't to inspire the technician class who think they can't do anything with their handheld radios. But Mount Wachusett, of course, is a great place to get contact. And just, you know, explore your radio creativity. And that's kind of where we're geared toward. We're going to get more specifically into the outdoors. And if anyone has any questions, just jump in and ask. I, I can't see any of you anymore. So I'm just, it's more like I'm just talking into a room myself. So keep that in mind. And if you want to jump in, just jump in. Uh, take an assessment of your physical abilities when we start talking about portable radio, um, meaning kind of man packing your radio with you. Um, you know, you could be at a point where just getting in, out of, in and out of bed is your physical activity, or you could be up, you know, the Iron Man's too easy uh, for you, or you can be like most of us somewhere in between. Uh, when you're planning trips, um, just get a sense of what that trip's going to look like. This is the Mount Wachusett Loop. Uh, it's a little it's not even three miles, I don't think, this loop from the visitor center uh, up to the top of Mount Wachusett and back. Uh, and it's a vertical gain of 728 feet for a total ev ev uh, elevation of, nine, of almost 2,000 feet. And I contrast this. This isn't going to mean quite as much to you guys, I don't think. But anyone who's familiar with the Middlesex Fells in uh, the greater Boston area, there's a walk in it called the Skyline Trail. And so this is a big, you know, Para City Park, you know, urban park for the most part, but it's got an eight mile loop and it has a total ascent of 1700 feet uh, on that loop. So uh, just keeping in mind of what the actual distance and thinking about elevation gain and what you're getting into when you head out into the outdoors, if you're gonna get that extreme. Uh, and then, so what special accommodations might you need? I personally think that there's a version of portable ops for anyone if, if, uh, with some sort of creativity. But you know, aside from any physical fitness issues, do you have any mobility challenges, disability, health problems, or other issues that may limit some of your access to certain types of portable operations? And are these true limitations or are they workarounds? And I find that you know, portable radio, there's a way to accommodate almost everyone, I think. 
And then finally, I think another point too is how interested are people actually in radio? How what is your baseline interest in radio? Are you just exploring it, wondering what HAM stands for, or are you designing radios, do it for a living, and you know, kind of on the very high end of uh, of your radio knowledge, or are you someplace in the middle, which again, a lot of us are. And finally, getting to the point where we get into the meat of the stock, what is your interest in portable radio? Um, if you, you know, watching this talk makes you feel like at least you're not drinking alone in your bedroom, then you know, good for you. Maybe you won't actually get out to a park, but I hope you enjoy the talk. Uh, if you've been inside for a year and can't wait to get out, which I think is somewhat fueling some of the interest in portable radio, uh, the fact that the pandemic really geared up a lot of uh, interest in this, I think. Um, that's probably where a lot of us fit in. And then, and then this is actually where I, and we'll get into this a little bit more, a little bit more philosophy here. Um, for me, portable ops is really quite really becoming a lifestyle choice. It's, it's on here is kind of a joke, but to me, it's not really. Um, I put up the spin diagram to kind of describe what I mean by this. And I, I don't think I need to talk to a group of experienced hands what it means to have radio as a lifestyle choice. I think you guys probably could tell me a lot more about that, given I've only been licensed for two years. But what is a lifestyle choice to me is something I call outdoorism. Uh, if I have my way, I'm outside. That's that's just simply what I mean by that. I, I will spend all of my free time as much of it I can uh, without having walls around me and enjoying the many activities that go along with being outdoors. Uh, and then what's happened with me is as I found amateur radio a few years back, uh, that combination of the two of them have become a very serious lifestyle choice. I'm actually uh, I'm now at 36 peaks. Uh, that I've climbed in the mostly in the New England area, but I'm going to keep going until you get the mountain goat, which is a thousand points. It's very hard in Massachusetts at one point a mountain, but uh, this is just something. And my husband also, uh, you know, we've been together a very long time, and we both have the same mentality about the outdoors. And then when I look at portable radio, uh, you know, that's a bigger picture to me as well too. Uh, as we get into this, uh, I really see communication to me is freedom and for me, there's going to be a lot of expression of freedom when it comes to operating portable. Uh, I think that there's really nothing that feels quite as free as climbing up a mountain with, uh, you know, a, a small, I like the 891, as you'll see, but uh, there's a few radios with 891, the Yaser 891 is the one I love. Uh, there's nothing quite like freedom, like walking up a mountain, throwing a wire in a tree and talking around the world. I mean, again, I, I doubt I have to express to you guys what that feels like. But as we get into the idea, you know, kind of the more philosophical part of this and a little bit more of what it means to have outdoors as a lifestyle, you'll see, uh, in, again, I think everyone turned into survivalists this past year, but uh, some of us have always kind of had that in our, in our makeup, and maybe most of us have it someplace, even if it's buried. But there's, I take a look at the outdoors um, as a lifestyle, and the, then the differences in the kind of outdoor survivalist hobbies. And this is the way that I classify them. You have your bushcrafters or your wilderness survivalists. These are people who want to survive without any or extremely limited man-made provisions. And then you have your preppers. Um, you know, they're looking at the worst case scenario. Maybe that came to light with the pandemic. Um, and they're preparing for that and want to survive that, whatever that is. And that'll include, they'll usually include something to do with the outdoors. Um, then you have the backpackers. And this was really kind of where I, would categorize myself. This is what I think of myself as. Uh, in, that, in essence, it's having everything that you need for basic wilderness survival in a backpack. And, uh, and you actually use that backpack. So it's not just a bug out bag that sits around. You're actually using what's in your pack. Um, and then I have the outdoors category. Maybe this is just something I make up, but it's something that's in my head. That's It's kind of the umbrella for any different act, outdoor activity that you participate in. And my debate point here is for all of uh, the folks out there who might be uh, thinking about the survivalist prepping points of view for the outdoors. But in my opinion, backpacking is the most useful skill in surviving calamity for the average able individual. This is my point of view and perspective on this. Everything needed to survive is in a single man portable backpack and you know how to use it. That's a real major difference, I think, between uh, backpackers and other types of preppers or survival, maybe not the survivalists, but 
particular type of preppers is that you actually use all of your equipment and you have a limited amount of equipment because you're carrying it on your back. And so it has to be very specially picked out. And with backpacking, you know, the idea of this bug out bag or bug in bags, really the same, you know, what difference does, does it make if you have your gear, if you have a building around you or not. So uh, with the pandemic, this was a picture that we took uh, from the pandemic. It was really just to show that recycled towels are still readily available in a lot of places. But the point I put up here is backpackers don't really care if there's paper products left or not. It just doesn't really matter if you're a backpacker. It doesn't get you as upset as it did a lot of people, uh, just because you're kind of used to not having a lot of provisions. Uh, so the typical backpacking gear um, that we're going to go through is you know, you need your food, water, and shelter. So with shelter being, in my opinion, the most important thing to consider, uh, you need a clothing system, either uh, some sort of tent, tarp, hammock, sleeping bag, or sleeping pad. Uh, food is the next most important system. And then in New England, what you need to think about very practically is that you need some sort of bear proofing strategy. So this can either be a bear can or a bear bag. Uh, that you take with you. And then you need your cooking equipment. So stoves, utensils, hot mug, fire starting device. And uh, and then next is water. Water is abundantly uh, available in New England. So you don't really so much have to worry about whether or not you bring water with you, even though you might bring water, but you really need a treatment system. So you need a filter. You need to either be able to filter, boil, purify, uh, or use some other sterilization like ultraviolet uh, techniques. And then you need water containers. So those are the things you really start to think about that are the basics of backpacking. Uh, from shelter, in New England, the most important shelter uh, needs are really uh, to reduce your risk of hypothermia. It's starting to get warmer out, so we're not worrying, worrying about that as much. But uh, even at 50 degrees ambient temp, so that's actually kind of where the strongest risk for hypothermia is, is when the temperature is around 50 degrees, because you get pretty complacent at 50 degrees, uh, but it, and so you're not as prepared as far as um, the clothing that you have and your, your own protection from the elements, but 50 degrees can really drop a, a person's body temperature as I think we all kind of intellectually know. Uh, so it's really high risk temperatures are, are when the temperatures drop to about 50 degrees. So just usually humans aren't all that prepared for those temperatures uh, and the effects on the body, even though we think we are. Uh, and then you use your shelter to protect from animals, uh, nuisances like bugs, other humans. So protect yourself from threats and to protect your equipment, uh, especially when we're talking radio. So backpacking shelter options will include lightweight fabrics. Uh, um, really, what I like to use is uh, tents and tarps that are very lightweight. So um, the, what I like the best are the synthetics that are embedded with liquid silicone, such as still nylon or still poly. I'm a fan of still nylon over still poly. It tends to be a little lighter. That stretches, so it does have its flaws. Uh, but it's a strong, non-breathable, wind and water resistant fabric and is very lightweight. Dyneema or Cuban fiber. Uh, Dyneema is the new name for Cuban fiber. That's ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. Uh, this is a newer, very, very expensive fiber, extremely lightweight and very, very strong. So a lot of the high tech gear you see is going to be uh, made out of Dyneema or again, the old name Cuban fiber. Uh, and then a tent, a tarp, a hammock, and then don't rule out using found structures such as lean tos and other shelters too. So those are, I, I happen to have a real penchant for I just like to include found structures in my radio. You'll see as we go through um, in my use of portable radio. This is my favorite tent, the Tarp Tent Radio Shadow 3. It's less than three pounds. It's still nylon. Uh, this You can't buy this version anymore. Um, Tarp Tent's a brand name. So this one's been retired for a while. It is a huge tent for three pounds, but it's exactly what it says it is. It's a tarp uh, in a bug screen. That's really the entire tent. And you can see as we get into this, and my dog Nelly, who goes on many adventures with us. Uh, I like to think of it as adventure radio. Uh, and you can see uh, I was camping for a few nights and had Nelly with me in my radio set up listening to 80 meters and falling asleep. Uh, the uh, just as a little bit of a comparison, you can see the tent itself really packs down quite small. So you have a 40 meter OCF and 50 
feet of coax here and just give you an idea how small that tent is. Um, a tarp, if you're gonna go out portable for almost any reason and you're not immediately at your car, a tarp is very, very useful. Uh, this is one that I really like, it's locally available. Uh, the REI quarter dome, this, is, this one's a polyurethane coated nylon, uh, but it's really quite nice. And one of the things for tarps that I like, besides just being lightweight, is that they have eye hooks on each side of them, so you can configure them in multiple ways. So this you can see, you might not be able to see it, but it's got little tie outs all the way around the, the edges of the tarps. That's one of the things that I look for, but this is only one pound and two ounces. So if you're heading out for any reason to operate portable uh, and you're not at an immediate shelter and you want to save your gear, a good tarp is a, is a good thing to take with you. We use tarps in all sorts of, uh, in all sorts of manners and configurations and uh, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, so this one was just to have a place to sit, a little windscreen behind us for, for this, it was a nice day. This one was to stop the rain. This one was just really a little bit of uh, shade and we were worried there was a sh small shower that came through, so this Tully Mountain again. I actually think this was Tully Mountain too in two different trips and I don't remember where this one is. Uh, and then uh, I use a slightly for winter. I like, uh, and if I don't have to worry about weight so much, then I like a little bit of a thicker tarp. This is a Sil Poly, uh, just a little thicker than the, uh, and a lot uh, bigger tarp um, than the REI quarter dome. And this just gives a little bit more protection. Uh, if you're gonna go to lean twos, there's a lot, there's a lot to take in in this picture. Um, this was a camping trip over the winter. Uh, and you can see, I, li I like to, when I can, throw a tarp up in front of a lean-to. It does have the disadvantage if you have a nice fire going or kind of blocking some of that warmth from the fire, but it, it's just nice to have a little bit of privacy. So you can see here, uh, the setup in this particular lean-to is uh, a couple of sleeping bags. You can make out the radio is right here. So my radio goes with me in most of these trips. Uh, and then this is my friend's sleeping bag. And I just want to note the difference between, uh, both of these were considered zero degree bags. Our bags are full down, um, and, like maybe about uh, 800 down. And then I think this might've been a down bag too, but this almost killed the person that went with us. The temperatures got into the twenties. This bag was totally insufficient versus the, our bags, which were toasty warm. Uh, you want to keep yourself off of the ground uh, so you, we have, um, we use air mattresses that have quite a bit of uh, insulating factors. My dog has her, her own sleeping bag as well. Uh, and this was a pretty inadequate air mattress too. So this was a really bad sleeping system compared to ours, which were kept us nice and warm and toasty. In fact, I actually had to kind of share my sleeping bag with her dogs because they were frozen too. So uh, we all made it, but it was kind of a learning experience, especially for her. Um, as I said, I really like found structures. This is uh, Overlook Mountain. It's worth four points for Minnesota fans, and it's a kind of a nice two mile hike up a road. Uh, but this is an old burnt out hotel up there. Uh, this was a parts on the air activation that actually my husband did, but I couldn't resist the fact that he actually set up his radio in this abandoned tractor, tractor trailer. So you'll see, we get a kick out of the stuff like this. Uh, this is me in a little, I don't know, munitions container. <laughs> I'm not really sure exactly what it is um, that, uh, that I was operating from. Uh, this is uh, one of the small mountains in New Hampshire I'm blanking on the name of right now, again, for a soda uh, activation. And it just started to rain, but I point out that contractor bags make absolutely awesome uh, quick tarps and protection for your equipment. I tend to, whenever I hike, I tend to throw one in my pack. And you'll see too, uh, we'll come back to it, but I, I really prefer just the double pouch Jan Sport for a lot of my hiking activities. Um, this is a couple more just operating from your vehicles. And I like to also creatively use my vehicle. I have a cargo van, um, but I'm sure that you guys have all operated, many of you have operated portable out of a vehicle. Um, you can see the my mom down here. So I like to also try to drop people into ham radio. That's one of the things I get a kick out of. My mom actually started enjoying it. She was listening to shortwave. Um, over here, this I'll point out because this is the middle of winter. And if you guys have, um, if you want a nice device, this is a little portable buddy heater. 
Um, it's a little propane heater. It's an exquisite device. I'm not sure. Uh, I think they do. They, they do market them for sale in, in Massachusetts with some restrictions, but absolutely awesome uh, device to have. You just need to open a window about 16, inch, uh, 16 square inches, I think is what the four by four area of uh, window open for ventilation. Uh, this was winter field day two years ago uh, at the New England Side Tech parking lot. Um, and this is my backyard in South Lake, so you can just see how I really like creatively um, utilizing what I can for right now. This was field day last year. I heard you guys talking about your field day. We too modified it. Um, the tent uh, was something that we kind of commandeered. Some other company had set this up that we, we have it at the New England Side Tech uh, facility. Any questions so far? Um, what sorry. modes do you operate? What's that? What modes do you operate? You know, I um, I operate, let's see, I, you know, I, a lot of them, FM, F sideband, uh, and then a little bit, a little bit FP8. I don't know the digital modes all that well at this point. So I've only had a few FP8 contacts. All of those are, <laughs> would give me pretty excited to have FP8 contacts, but. Um, what are pretty much whatever I can start figuring out. How much power are you normally running? Uh, I have, uh, you know, we'll get into the radio equipment pretty soon, but at 100 watts, I, I almost always run 100 watts on my 891. I have the 705 too, so, uh, but I spend more time with receiving on that than I do actually, uh, um, than I do actually transmitting. The eight, the FT eight ninety one is my very favorite radio. I've the uh, E fifty seven too. So um, we'll get, I have the radio stuff coming up pretty soon, so we'll get. Mindy, do you do any CW? Um, you know, I'm part of the Long Island CW Club, and I've made a couple of CW contacts. I'm pretty, I'm not great at it at this point. I still have a ways to go before I'm proficient. So, so one quick thought, you know, when you were talking about technicians. You might want to consider technicians have a lot of CW privileges on like 40 meters, 80, 15. So you can also encourage them to do some HF. Yeah, no, that's a great point, Tom. I don't that, that think I saw point. that. Yeah. But that's another way of uh, getting the uh, technician people interested. Yeah, that, and uh, I mean, I think CW to me seems like it's all their age too now. I mean, most people I know are trying to learn CW, but again, is it the purple car phenomenon? Because I've been attempting, I, I get on the air occasionally. I'll throw. I, I actually think I made my first uh, Poda chaser contact, but I'm not sure it was ever confirmed. <laughs> um, anything else? All right, outdoor clothing. Uh, I'm gonna skip. I, I want to get to some of the more meaty radio stuff, but wear appropriate clothing when you're outside, and use a layered system. It's really important. Uh, I put these up. This, this one here, you can see this wheel came off this cart. This is 60 pounds of radio gear that we carted into a shelter. Uh, so make sure the equipment that you use actually works well. But I also put this up to show the many layers. Uh, layered clothing is a way to go to even these aren't great. This is frog togs. You know, those aren't expensive. Not a lot of it's very expensive gear. Um, per se. The other thing is the micro spikes in the winter are an absolute necessity if you're hiking anywhere. Your sleeping system is life or death. You want a ground cloth, a sleeping mat, pad, sleeping bag. Don't trust the temperature readings. Again, you can see our setup, which I showed you in the last one. Uh, this was uh, this was winter field day this year. Uh, we were in a caboose, and it was an uninsulated caboose. And if you guys remember, it got down to zero degrees uh, that night. And our bags did really well, but for the most part, we were frozen. Uh, so if we're talking about food, um, the biggest part about food that I want to put in is if you're going out and you're staying out, just think about getting a, a bear can like the Garcia backpack or pantry bear can. You can sit on it. Uh, try not to eat at your campsite as well. You really do have to watch out for the animals out there. These are red fox and coyote that we've seen out on our travels. I'm sure you guys are well aware of the animals up in your, in your area are starting to get into bear territory up there. And if you get really hungry, you can find some chicken in the woods to eat. 
um, when it comes to water, you want to be able to start a fire. Uh, make sure you bring your matches, your ferro rod, uh, light or something that can start a fire. You can boil your water, cook heat. Um, a good tip is cotton balls saturated with Vaseline is a good fire starter. Uh, and then decide on your purification method and have some sturdy plastic bottles with you. Um, wide mouth plastic bottles make a good scoop. So your choices are going to be sterilization with maybe UV. Uh, that's a SteriPen here. You can have different filter configurations, either gravity or squeeze bottle or pump. Uh, backpacking stove options. I'm, I prefer the solo stove. I like the little wood stove. And then my backup's usually an alcohol stove. But if you like multi-fuel stoves, those are available too. So you can see this is uh, the wood stove. So a few more pictures of uh, um, of uh, our, our fire setup. And then the backpack becomes there's a, it, uh, a very important thing as well. There's other items we like to take. Always take a headlamp, a multi-tool, maps, trekking poles are things that always end up in my kit. Uh, with a backpack, uh, you want to aim for 25 pounds or less worth of gear to be comfortable, in my opinion. Uh, but my ham gear itself weighs more than 15 pounds. So if I'm going out for an overnight, I'm looking at usually with my ham gear, it's about 40 pounds of weight. Uh, my Jansport is one of my favorite backpacks to use, and I can carry about 20 pounds comfortably in that. But if I'm going overnight, I'm carrying an internal frame pack uh, versus an external frame pack. My current pack is, you'll see it's a giant, this is for winter gear, especially, and plus my dog, uh, 85 liter, liter giant Dyneema Hyperlite bag. So you can see the size of that pole here. That's 40 pounds of gear I have on my back right here. All right, so let's get to the radio uh, specific part of this. There's many, as you guys know, portable radio programs out there. Uh, parks on the air, summits on the air, special state parks on the air type of, events, special stations, contests, chasing, hunting, and just because. So this is where we really get into, uh, we'll finish up here with the gear choices that I like for radio. Uh, this is a, a few things you'll see repeated themes. Uh, this happens to be a 40 meter OCF by frequency devices that I keep on, this is what I run at my PTH as well. Um, but that'll come up quite a bit. So when you're thinking about your transceivers, you need to decide if you want to run QRO or QRP. Um, I personally like, uh, typically like a hundred watt radio. So I, I like to run QRO. Um, but I do like, like I said, I have a 705 as well. Uh, so for beginners, I think it's fun to make more contacts. I, I would tend to have people go toward a, uh, a higher power radio. Um, but as you get more experience, it's kind of more fun to make difficult contacts. I think we probably all experienced that. Um, are you going to do CW only? Are you going to um, build or buy? If you're going QRP, I think you have a lot more options. If weight's not in consideration, then use whatever you want. And then uh, then consider, you know, if you're doing UHF, VHF only, you have a lot of choices as far as HCs and everything. But when it comes to a uh, currently manufactured sub six pound HF capable radio, uh, you're, you're kind of limited in your choices. The Yaesu EFT891 is 4.2 pounds, uh, so it's just HF plus 6 meters, 100 watts, and that's almost your only choice that I know of uh, um, that is under 5 pounds, under 6 pounds, I think. I wanted to bring in the, the Jaidu here, G90. Um, and then QRP, you have a few more choices, the 818, the 705, the Elecrops, uh, the and then the Jaidus. Um, as well. But uh, again, for a QRO rig, you're pretty limited if you're under six pounds. You have to decide if you want a tuner. I think for a QRO, then uh, the idea that you can use a lot of different kind of, con you know, more extremely compromised antennas uh, is better to uh, go ahead and have a tuner with a QRO rig. You know, then you don't really care so much if you're losing some power because of the ATU. Um, QRP, I think it depends, but you probably, as we all know, want to use a resonant antenna if you're using a five watt radio. Uh, so there's a lot of, I, I feel like you have a lot of room to play with QRO, QRP, you have to really dial it in. So I think it depends where you are in your radio journey. So this is my kit specifically. Um, this is what I tend to bring if I'm not too, too concerned with weight. Uh, I've upgraded my Bofang just barely to a um, 
one of the low end model uh, Yesus. Uh, the, uh, and then these two, I'll point out for anyone who has an 891, our portable gear, I'll point out this packet, P-A-C-K-I-T, um, that fits like a glove, the Yaesu 891, one particular model. So, um, and then again, there's the 40 OCF, 50 feet of coax. This was kind of my earlier setup. Uh, you can see here, uh, this was the 857, and I, I like the Z100 Plus tuner for both the 891 and for the 857. I think it works really well for that. I, I want to get it set up with the 705, but I've yet to use the tuner with that radio yet. I use a 15 amp hour BioNO, um, and then just the, the Mindy. Oh, go ahead. Yep. How much does the battery weigh? I'm curious for the you know 15 amp hour hour. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I, you know, I, I don't know exactly. It's got to be somewhere, it's got to be around the five pound range. The entire kit weighs about 15 pounds. So I, I think the battery probably approaches five pounds, maybe a little bit less than that. Hey, good. But, that's a, that seems like a pretty, pretty good weight for that much power. That's very yeah. good. Yeah. I mean, we, I mean, it really, yeah, it works really well. I mean, we'll stay on the air for, for quite a while with that. I've actually never run it out of, uh, um, out of juice. Mindy, this is Phil. What was that yep. item in the upper left-hand corner in the previous slide? Oh, so this is a this is in, in um, a lead acid uh, goal zero. Uh, so, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so it's what they call solar generators now. I think um, it's just an inverter. It's just a, a battery right. inverter package. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, and then we also like to go out in with groups of people so i really strongly i mean sure you guys use these for uh field day of some sort but um i do have a full set of hf band pass filters that i really like to bring with us um usually and usually it'll be 20 40 and 80. um but we have my husband and i have three oh, fairly identical setups with uh three different 15 amp hour batteries ldg tuners uh variety of wire antennas and, uh, and we do like to bring people out with us and set all these up at the same time. Uh, the 891 fits into a, a gallon Ziploc bag, which I find to be important uh, if you're taking it anywhere near the water. When it, when it comes to batteries, uh, if you're running Furo, uh, again, there's probably nothing nothing new with the lead to you guys, but the lead acid, you know, has that very, uh, you know, a very, very heavy, got the voltage drop as you use it and you can only discharge it about 50 percent uh, versus the lithium batteries in particular the uh, lith lithium ferrous phosphate uh, these are relatively light and you can deep discharge them down to 80 90 percent maybe even more uh, the one thing if you're buying the bioenos uh, to keep in mind which may or may not be something that you guys have uh, thought through but if you're going to buy the the bioenos uh, make sure that they can actually um, provide the, the amperage that you need for your radio. So the, the FT891 at 100 watts will put out 23 amps on transmit. And uh, so that means that you really have to have a, um, a LIFEPO battery, a BioNO LIFEPO that's 12 amp hours or more. Uh, 15 amp hours, it has a max um, continuous discharge of 30 amps, but there are nine amp hours, only 12 amps. So just keep that in mind if you're if you're going to purchase a battery. And that, that Tom, is one of the reasons why I went for the, the larger battery, so I could just run full power on the radio. And this is just showing the, the voltage dropping off of, this was, this was hand drawn by me, you can probably tell, uh, but the voltage dropping off of the LIFO battery, uh, where it'll, it'll hold its voltage as you discharge it versus lead acid, which will drop its voltage. Uh, solar charging is also uh, a possibility. I do have a solar charging system that I really like. It's a 60 watt folding panel. So you can get an idea here uh, if you compare it to the battery, how small this panel folds. Um, and then the 15 hour life po. And then a charge controller that, again, one thing to keep in mind with your charge controllers is that it has to be specific for your, your lithium batteries. And then the correct cables. Uh, this is a hint. This is actually from a Harbor Freight. Um, uh, connection kit and it's invaluable because it has the same uh, barrel size as the, the bioeno battery so it's a good connector to be able to find if you're not making your own. 
Ooh, little here. Oh, there we go. This is the solar panel in use and true portable here in this cart. And again, in use, I you know use it in any different way that I can figure out how to use my equipment. I try to use it. And uh, so you can see that this even in kind of you can't really run in partial shade. You need full sun on it, or you're gonna really drop the um, the uh, output of the panel. But I can get about 2.5 amps in good sunlight uh, from that from that solar panel, which is pretty good, I think. So you know, full day will charge that battery back up. Uh, when it comes to antenna choices, I really like wire antennas in general uh and then we're just about done here but i'll go through some of my antennas um this was a diy 20 meter dipole um with no bail-in the interesting part about this is when i set it up pretty much on the ground on my fence at home i had a nice swr but when i put it up in the air at my farm in upstate new york uh it was much shorter than uh, much electrically more electrically short than it appeared initially um this is my 40 meter ocf uh which i the frequency devices i found this just randomly on amazon and purchased it i tend, i really love this uh antenna it's again what i have in my tch um this is a 20 meter n fed this is a lot like what the arl um is now putting out as a kit and this is a fantastic don't make fun of me because i know the swrs are all off here but this is a fantastic uh Antenna, I'm sure the kit is great too. Um, it was very similar. I, I just used two toroids in mine. Um, and again, the SWRs are off, you can tell, but I actually didn't ever, I, I just had a radiator. I never really measured it. I just had a radiator and saw if it was close enough if I could get on the air. I made plenty of contacts on this. Um, and so the 10 mil, uh, meter dipole uh, that I home, home brew with uh, coax and a toroid choke. And, so it's pretty good in the in the 10 meter uh, band. And then my very favorite is the radio waves 20 meter end bed. Th this thing is a is uh, it, it, most of my contacts I would say and most of my husband my husband almost only exclusively uses this antenna. Uh, he can get on 20 meters and 80 meters. Makes a lot of contacts actually with this on 80 meters. Believe it or not, it does have a problem in that. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of screen relief, so I've broken a few of these. Easy enough to fix, but yet another problem. And then when I do want to run uh, UHF, VHF, I just put a diamond antenna on a tripod. And finally, masks. Uh, many choices of masks. The ones I have are military masks and the Mr. Longarm painter poles, which you've seen through this. Uh, I got a fiberglass mask and tow hook now, and fishing poles, trees, found structures. This is a picture of my farm. This was some contest, but maybe the portable ops contest with the military mask set up. Again, another picture of the military mask. We use that for field day two, the Mr. Long Arms Painter Pole. This was the caboose on winter field day with the Mr. Long Arms Painter Pole and then an 80 meter dive pole. Um, OCF on there. Painter Pole again. Fishing pole up on a mountain. Uh, this one, I just, this one's. Uh, unique in the sense I didn't have any ropes. I just taped the end of it. I did have electrical tape to the pole. I'd forgotten to bring rope, which is why I had to use it at all. Um, and then I also like this these configurations of just tying a mask to a tree. Again, I, I talked about liking to use found structures. Uh, I was delighted when this, I think it was just, just this past weekend, we went up uh, um, Utsayantha Mountain in upstate New York, and I was able to tie off to the tower, so that made me extremely happy. And again, so I use whatever trees there are. This is Pope John Paul Park, and then tied off to the pavilion. And then this is the VHF contest. Uh, really, I didn't, I did not make any contacts, but it was more important for me. I put a mass support onto my my truck um, and it was more important for me just to get on the air because we're going to use this for field day and I also have a six meter uh, um, beam that I'm going to put up on it too. Again, found structures all. I think I end with this one. Uh, this is me on White Face Mountain in upstate New York convincing the official to let me use the flagpole for the 20 meter and, uh, and they did so got my 10 points up there.
anyways, that's the end, guys. Uh, hopefully it wasn't too long for you, but thank you so much for uh, for letting me talk here and let's see if I can get back to you guys there. <laughs> thank you very much, Mindy. That was great. Uh, and, and this is the problem with Zoom. You can't hear people doing this, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll approximate. Uh, I have one question, but I'm, I'm sure people have other questions because I think the floor is still open for questions. Um, I'll just start it off and then I'm sure other people will chime in. This is not a radio question. Um, you went back, when you were talking about bags, you very quickly kind of just said, don't trust the temperature rating on the bag. So if you can't trust the temperature rating on the bag, is it all cut and try? Or how do you actually figure out that you've really got a bag that is going to go down that far? You know, it's not, the temperature ratings are, are no good for the most part. If you, you have to, you have to do your research on, on the bags that you buy. Uh, and it's really a shame that uh, there's no real good way of, of <laughs> knowing. Um, you have to know the brand and you have to be able to trust the brand. Um, okay. And that's, and then you test it out in safe situations to make sure I mean, this was sure. a very, we knew we could evacuate that that was a shelter that was about it was only about a mile and a half walk in from where the car was we knew we could evacuate but that that particular bag put my friend in a lot of danger and put two dogs in a lot of danger mm. that ended up with me uh and plus you know my own my own dog who was safe she has a she has a good sleeping bag but i actually had to take one of her dogs into my sleeping bag and not wasn't just a dog, it was a hundred pound boxer. So I actually had to lay out like a quilt and warm him up because he was getting hypothermic. So right. um, that became a pretty, we, I thought we were going to have to evacuate out of that because of her sleeping bag. So I think the, the you know, that's where you really have to, you, you, you're not going to get off on a cheap uh, winter bag. They're expensive. Those the bags we have are close to a thousand dollar bags. Right, right. So you're going to have to spend the money, and if you're really going to sleep outside in them or in zero degrees in a caboose, um, you 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 don't have the choice. Sure, of course. Feathered Friends is a good one. Uh, they're <laughs> quite reputable, and then we have uh, um, ours are uh, oh geez, Mountain Hardware is another very mm. good, yep. very very good uh, um, down bags. I've seen them at REI. Yeah. Uh, I have another one, but Bruce, go ahead. Let's let's be equitable. So first, Mindy, thank you very much for the presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I have a question regarding summits on the air. Um, I see absolutely no summits in eastern Massachusetts. <laughs> and I've got to believe places like, um, um, you know, uh, Blue Hill uh, down in, in Milton slash Canton, um, a few other places come to mind have to qualify. Is there something going on with summits on the air? Um, why aren't there more local summits that we could, you know, do like pretty easy hikes to? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I, I do have the, I do know the answer of uh, great blue, uh, in the blue Hills. Uh, one of our club members is, uh, he actually works at the Blue Hills Observatory and he tried to get Great Blue as part of Summits on the Air. It falls short by a handful of feet to what they feel qualifies as a peak. So Great Blue actually doesn't count. Um, I, can't, I can't remember what the exact number of feet it needs to be, but it, it literally is, you could probably jump up high enough to make it qualify, but uh, they're pretty strict. I, I don't actually think there's anything going on. Great Blue is the largest uh, peak in the eastern Massachusetts. I don't actually think there's anything going on with it. Unlike, unlike parks on the air, the mountaineers, uh, and especially in Britain, mountaineers are very serious when they come in general. And especially, they're, they're not inclusive. They're very, mountaineers tend to be a very exclusive group. Even just their point structure you have to get a thousand points uh, to really get the mountain goat award. Uh, they, they don't care if it's not convenient for you. They, 
they figured you can get to a mountain someplace. Unlike POTA on the flip side, which is a real inclusive program, and they've right. just made a whole bunch of, I don't know if you guys do a lot of POTA, but they've made a whole bunch of new parks uh, available in Massachusetts right now, which is terrific. So POTA definitely leads the pack when it comes to trying to get people into ham radio. The mountaineers, they don't care if you <laughs> if your mountain qualifies or not. Right. And I know, like, for example, the islands out in Boston Harbor, there's a bunch of places you can go there that qualify for parks on the air. It's just the, I guess the summits are just still kind of exclusive. And yeah, well, uh, all, there are plenty, uh, though. Yeah. Well, all I've got to tell you is I, I am having a hard time finding the rules, but I'll also <laughs> tell you that I lived in England for several years and I'm not aware of any peaks in Southern England that come anywhere close to what uh, Great Blue Hill is. And yet there's a number of big boxes um, in Southern Britain. So I'm gonna take a look at some of these and try to figure out what they mean, so. Yeah, there, the, um, so Tully Mountain, there are there are peaks, Tully Mountain, Wachusett, Watadic, uh, Toby, uh, Grace. So there are, there are definitely peaks in the area that do count, but there are. Uh... Yeah, I, I haven't figured out though how Mount Watadic is bigger than 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 no. uh, Great Blue Hill. Okay? Yeah. When you oh, compare it, it to the surrounding areas. Oh it, it, yeah, it, it is though. Yep, there. That's legitimate. Watadic is taller than Great Blue. Is it uh -huh. a matter of the relative uh -huh. elevation or absolute? Is it, it? It's, it is the saddle. It does make a difference. And, and it is okay. the relative. Uh, it's uh, the relative climb. Okay. It's both. It's both the height and the relative. Ah. So that's why some of the, um, that's my understanding at least. Uh, mm -hmm. That's why some of the peaks that you think should be a part of it just don't seem to be. There's right. some in the, like Bear's Den Conservation Area has some peaks that I think could be challenged to be there, but I don't, the actual approach, I don't know if that makes the vertical, I don't know if the vertical gain counts for sure. those. Rusty tried. I, I don't know if he ever got an official answer to be honest, but he, he has tried and, and is in communication with them. I think he was told now. Um, I have a question. That, somebody's answering that in a uh, better language than me. And that oh, in the chat, fun. Jessica. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, Fran, you, uh, John, I know you've got a question. Fran, have you resolved your audio yet? No. Sorry. Ah, John, go ahead, I guess. Uh, are you familiar with the Appalachian Winter uh, uh, Peaks, peaks awards where you go from one peak to another from I think starts in January and it goes all the way through February and March and you have to go to 55 peaks to get the award it's it's a grueling challenge no is it part of soda or something different well, this is from the Appalachian Club oh so that's just climbing period yeah okay without a radio no i i don't know that no hmm. no that that sounds tough to me <laughs> yeah. soda soda has winter bonus points of three points per uh peak however there's not a single ma uh, mountain in massachusetts that qualifies for that sure so even if you height you know even if you are take a seven eight mile because they don't take the approach into consideration either so even if you're in a seven eight mile hike up a mountain you um in snowshoes you, you don't get your winter um points because of the elevation gain other questions mindy i have one uh so when you're up on the peak my understanding is that you sometimes will either have set up some kind of announcement that you're there or somebody will spot you. So how have you been working that in order to not just be up there transmitting and you know nobody kind of knows you're there? Yeah, so that, I mean, so I guess there's a trade-off in Massachusetts usually can get cell service. So uh, we go ahead and we you go on to the Soda, um, Soda Watch. It, um, it's just part of the Soda site and we, we will go ahead and spot ourselves. Self-spotting is fine. 
Um, there are other times where we'll ask people if we'll ask people to spot us if need be. And then worst case scenario, and I you the, with soda you only need four contacts. So worst case scenario, I'll chase when I'm up there, but I'm not. Oh. For the most part, I'm not leaving a mountain without my point. <laughs> so I, uh, the picture at Whiteface, there is no cell service up on that peak. That's uh, um, one of the high, high peaks in Adirondacks. And uh, so that particular peak, uh, I, we did have to chase. Um, but the trade-off for that was that I drove up with my mom. So I got 10 points for that one with my mom. <laughs> And it got to drive up it. And I'll tell you, we'll take the points where we can. There's no there's no pride when it comes to trying to get a thousand of these in New England. So So driving is okay if you can it, yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, I think so there's a little bit of debate of uh if you do the last hundred feet in elevation, something like that, walk up uh. the last hundred feet in vertical elevation gain. They've dropped that rule in some uh in some areas and not in others, but uh, I'm that's one I'm willing to. If I can find a mountain to drive up, that's fine with me. I hike up plenty of them for a point. Okay. Other questions? I want to hog all the questions here. Okay. I might throw, sorry, it's like me, but I might throw oh, one more in there. I have a question. <laughs> oh, yes, please. Somebody else. Go ahead. Do you, do you guys ever use ground counterpoises in, when you're using your NFET? Uh, you know, not not typically. I We don't have any, uh, no, not typically. I, I'd like to think that probably the coax functions in that manner, but uh, I, I don't bother putting a, another um, counterpoise on it. It works fine without it. And like I said, even with even getting on 80 meters, we know we almost never have problems getting contact, especially if we can spot ourselves. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Sure. Bill. Uh, I noticed in one of your slides there was a little wagon, little four wheel wagon. And I'm wondering oh. if you use that to carry gear on mountain trails. Yeah. I don't. Uh, just the one wagon with the broken wheel, um, we thought would be better than our packs, and I regret that. But no, that little wagon, the I think it's a I think it is a radio flyer. That little wagon was at my parents' house. <laughs> so that's just in the backyard of my parents' house. That particular shot. Oh, and about the blah. And about the blah. Go ahead. I was going to say, so there's a message from Fran in the chat room, Fran K1ILR, who's having the audio problems. Right. And he first apologizes for the audio issue. And then he says, uh, Mindy, thanks so much for your presentation. Uh, a question I have is whether there are any informal calling frequencies that folks use who use the park, who are involved in the parks on the air. Uh I can't speak to CW, um, but when it comes to a sideband, I'll tell you, we jump on wherever we can or wherever we can find a, a frequency. So I don't, um, what, I don't bother with any particular areas of the, I, I like to remember to stay in the general portion. Sometimes I forget, but, <laughs> that, but that's about it. I'll just go to any free frequency when it comes to POTA or SOTA. Indy, I've seen people use uh, Garmin inReaches. I've, I've seen a lot of advertisements for them fairly recently for, you know, punch the button if you're really in a desperate situation yeah. and it goes up to the satellite. I could also imagine that people who would get themselves into situations they should never be in the first place and then punch the button, get a whole bunch of other people involved trying to get them out of there. So I don't know if there's any feeling in the community one way or another about carrying those. Yeah, um, you can you can get rescue insurance through them. Uh, at least you can through the spot. Uh, I'm a little less certain about the inReach, but I think you can as well. I carried a spot device which doesn't allow you. The inReach I think allows you to do two way um, conversations, but the uh, the spot just allows you to send out a signal to to folks let let them know you're alive. Um, when we hike the Northville Plaza Trail, there's that's pretty that's probably pretty wildernessy. And when this was when my dad actually found out how uh, remote that was, uh, 
after a lot of uh, phone fights between him and me, I finally took a spot with me so he know we were alive. But, you know, there's places in there where the nearest escape is 20 miles out. So um, that's right through the heart of the Adirondacks. So, and there's, it's probably a lot more well-traveled now, but it was a few years back when my husband and I did it. And uh, so I personally... I gotta say, I personally, I, I wouldn't bother, but there's family members. It really was comforting to my family and because they were the ones dropping us off. Uh, I think they wouldn't have dropped me off if I didn't have a device with me. But um, no, I think most people are now getting uncomfortable with the idea of satellite phones and having um, that protection. I first, my, my feeling with, um, and my husband and I both feel very similarly uh, to this and I think it's to our detriment. You're probably safer bringing one with you. Um, we're, we tend to feel like we're not gonna get injured and that's the wrong approach, I would say for the most part when you're out in the woods, but that's how we, you know, you just go on your experience. It's been, you've been, you know, walking out in the woods for 40 years and haven't had a bad experience, but of course all it takes is one. So I do think if you have access to one, there, that's fine. And I think you can get insur rescue insurance uh, to allay the cost of the search and rescue. That's the other thing. They will charge you. You'll get a bill. Oh yeah. There, yeah. There's um, a review of the, uh, of those items in the newest QS. In fact, QSD, there is, there is the bill. Monthly right. charges, the monthly charges are quite high, significant cost. It's a couple yeah. hundred bucks a month. Yep. You can, the, you can turn them off though. So you can do it monthly and you can turn them yeah. on and, and off. Um, but yeah, I don't, I just, no, I just—it's really cavalier about it. It's really tough, though, if you need one and have to turn it on, and you can't turn it on because you need one. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a problem. No. Tom, you had your hand up there. Tom, unmute. There we are. Yeah, thank you, Mindy. Nice, uh, excellent presentation. Just a quick question. Have I seen recently that you, uh, I think through one of the other local clubs, maybe possibly Wellesley, have I seen you trying to generate interest by, you know, holding some, not summits on the air, which probably involve more hiking, but have I heard recently you've been doing some sort of like local day, day trips with club members to a, maybe a park or something like that? And is that something you think you will do? And one other quick question, and do in the future. And one other quick question is, how would you describe your participation between Soda and Potter? Poda is it, it's from the presentation. It sounded like you like Soda. You like the hiking. You like the mountain topping. Uh, do you have a preference of one over the other? Um, kind of equal, where, where do you stand on your POTA versus SOTA activity? Thank you. Uh, so the, uh, the first part of that, Tom and, and everyone, um, is I keep an email list. Uh, it's kmindy.kmindy at gmail.com, km1ndy.km1ndy at gmail.com. Uh, and it's, it's not really affiliated with any club. And what I do is once every six weeks or so, throw out an idea we're going to go activate someplace and last one was the blue hills uh we actually have kind of a good crew that shows up we had about 30 people come to the blue hills just bring your radio enjoy life what we walked up the blue hills so yeah that, that's just a regular ongoing activities that i like to do um and, so do you like to if i can ask do you like yeah. to encourage newcomers to that or do you prefer to stay with the group you have absolutely absolutely no 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 it is for it is for anybody, it, it's designed to be entirely low pressure. You just show up, bring, you show up when, when you want with whatever gear you want, or you just have a concophony, a radio. I mean, we're probably all interfering with one another really, but it's still <laughs> really nice events. Um, but yeah, then, and we've had, I don't know, I think about six of them, including the Wachusett, Blue Hills, Callahan, a couple of state parks. And then the <laughs> second- Oh. That sounds great. How can we find out if you have one of these planned? Is there any uh, communication or should people just get on your list or what? I mean, I, the, the list, I'll just, yeah, I mean, that's the only, what ends up happening is 
um, W1DAN, Dan will often post to Wellesley or sometimes it'll show up in Bark. So people just post it. Sometimes it shows up at the ARL. I don't really even know how it gets. If, if, you let, if you let me know, I could also post it on our Eastern Mass website, yeah. unless you think too many people might then show up if, yeah. if we did that. But we'd be happy to help you if you wanted to uh, send a notice to me okay. or to Phil, Temp Phil Temples too, if you know Phil. Phil posts, I think Dan sends them to Phil and Phil tends to post them up. I tend to see them and no, they're, they're for anyone and anywhere. They're totally open. And so far we've not, I thought maybe the Blue Hills were going to get kicked out, but so far the Rangers have been really good to us. <laughs> it's been pretty. Oh, rave. I mean, it's kind of a radio rave. I mean, I got to be honest. Uh, <laughs> some, that's the chat that we put that in there. Um, they're fun. And we have a good time. The second, the second question is, uh, whoop, whoop. I only care about when it comes to points. The only points I care about in the world are soda because I want to get my soda, the mountain goat award. So my thousand points for soda are the only points I care for. But I love to operate portably, and Poda gives you a great reason just to get out and operate. So uh, I think the Poda program is absolutely yeah, it is fabulous the photo program for getting people out and on the air um it, but for me personally the only the only point structure i care about is uh is summits on the air and it will take me a lifetime at one point from now to get a thousand of them so <laughs> got a long ways to go <laughs> but we hiked up i mean tom for that matter i mean we we all hiked up oh well, some people drove but watch you said some of the drive up mountains make great targets for a group soda, but the group events are fun. Anyone else? Okay, so um, I'll turn it back to Bruce. By the way, I'd like to thank Skip K1NKR for uh, kind of the discovery that led me to uh, find you, Mindy, and uh, you know, invite you over. So. Um, Thanks again very much. This was really informative and very, very interesting. I, I think we all really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me here. Absolutely. Thanks, Jim, and Phil.